So this morning I'm going to continue through um, the last part of Romans chapter 4. And it's not surprising when I laid it out. I know what I'm speaking about this morning, thank you. And I know the, um, some questions that I'm going to put. And it's almost like as I write things out, it's interesting. I don't know if you had that thing this morning where it was like, should I, should I not bother? <sighs> Because we were awake at two this morning, and I, did, I had a little voice in the house saying, you know, reti- um, replace the battery. And the beat do not wake me up, but a voice in the house does. So, smoke alarm with an American accent for some reason. So, that had to get sorted. But it's interesting, so I'm going to encourage everybody else to actually um, listen to this when we finish. So, hopefully, it'll be good, is what I'm saying. So everyone's good at learning things, and something I learned this week, I'm just rambling on, so I'm going to pause and start the sermon in a minute for, my, uh, for Malcolm, but I learned something this week, if you look at our Bible, you've got six, six books, and the end of the Old Testament ends in Malachi, and it ends with a bit of a downer, the yeah, last few verses of Malachi is a bit of a downer, and then you jump into the New Testament, it's the genealogy of Jesus, but actually in the original Hebrew Bible, it actually ended with Chronicles. Two Chronicles to us, but Chronicles, which ends with Cyrus saying, God has appointed me to build the temple, and if anybody wants to go, let them go. And then into the genealogy of Jesus, which I thought is a lot better than the way we've got it laid out. So I've looked somewhere, the Hebrew Bible and the Septuagint add it in a different order to what we have it in, but uh, it's all still there, but that's good. So I'm going to pause. It's just a mark, is that one? In order to edit it. So if you've got a Bible, if you want to turn to Romans chapter 4, and I'm going to start at verse 16, but real verse 18 is what I want to eat. And this week I'll unpack some stuff, and next week something more. So this week I've called it Walking in Faith, part 1. Because if you've got a part 2, you've got a part 1, haven't you? So verse 16 says this, Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be a guarantee to all of us. Abraham's offspring, not only those who are of the law, but also those who have faith of Abraham, that's us. He is a father of us all, as it is written, I will make you a father of many nations. He is a father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things uh, into being that are not. We looked at that last, last time. God is a God who calls things into being when they're not, and that's why we can put our trust and our faith in him. Verse 18 says this again. So now Paul's going to write a situation in where Abraham put his faith and trust in God. So he's actually gone, made a statement, and now he's just going to unpack it a little bit. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became a father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without wavering in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. You need to unblind that a little bit in the Bible. He had the power, uh, he was persuaded that God had the power to do whatever he promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were not written, were written not just for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus from the, um, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he will also deliver over to death for our, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So it's verse 18 I just want to unpack, but a little question to ask yourself. Have you ever had somebody do something for you which has been really nice? And not talking just Christmas where you get a box of chocolates that you really didn't want, or an air dryer in my case. But you know when people give you stuff or do something for you, somebody who does something for you, that's actually really good. Now I was going to ask a question, uh, has anybody ever done some of that's been life changing? And it got me thinking for myself, uh, I mean number one is your mum, because without her, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> and 
having a kid can be very much life changing. So not just for the kid, but also for you, for the parent. But being parents is an interesting one. But then I also got thinking, to think about things that God has done for us. So this sermon is really a list of questions I'm going to pose and pull them apart and dig into them. But you maybe want to ask these in the act of small groups, but you know, what is something that God's done for you? Other than getting saved, what has God done for you? And that led me on to the, an interesting question and a thought in the, the middle of that, I've got a notepad and I sometimes wake up and write things down, but what is the greatest thing that God ever did? I mean, you could say, well, the flood were a big thing, will not it? No, well, not really. Creation, it's there, it's a big thing. But actually, if you look through a Bible, raising Jesus from the dead is probably the greatest thing Jesus, uh, that God did. Why? Because all hell went against him. In creation, hell didn't go against him. The flood, there were a bit of a battle going on. There were others going on throughout the, the Old Testament. But God raising Jesus from the dead is the greatest thing that God has ever done himself and also for us because without him raising Jesus from the dead we wouldn't have salvation. So raising Jesus from the dead is the most mightiest thing that God could ever do and I want you to keep that in mind because throughout the New Testament we're always referred to the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus was raised from the dead. Now this isn't just to, to make it fill in the pages. If it's the greatest thing that God ever did, he wants to keep it in focus. If you look at creation, there's only about four chapters in the Bible that really dig into the creation, and two at the beginning and a couple of Psalms and stuff like that. But when it comes to the redemption of mankind, the Bible's full of from beginning to end. And not only is the four Gospels dedicated to the life, death, burial and resurrection of Jesus, all through the New Testament it's referring back to the resurrection of Jesus. So the more that the Bible mentions them, the more important it is. So Jesus being raised from the dead is probably the biggest and greatest thing that God ever did. And now we're in Christ. So Abraham, it says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. So against the odds, he still trusted. Against what everything else was going on, he still stood his ground and said, now, we'll get to this next week, he wasn't stupid. It wasn't, I'm naming this and claiming that. He said, it was against all hope, he hoped. Why? Because he trusted in the one and believed what had been told to him. We need to keep that all in mind, especially for, for next time. But Abraham trusted God in all hope, against all hope. Abraham, in hope, believed. So if God's biggest job was raising Jesus from the dead, when Jesus gave his life, he gave it over for us. Now a question you know, I'd like to ask is, when you gave your life to Jesus, did you know what you know today? He said, I am leading you somewhere. I'm actually going to lead you into a brick wall where you won't be able to argue about anything and it's going to be thought, but keep with me on this one. So did you know what you know today? No. <clears throat> Question again. How much faith did you have when you got saved? How much faith did you have when you got saved? Well, I'll tell you about mine, shall I? Virtually none. I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know the to church. I had not gone on YouTube because I wanted around in those days. You know, I would not read anything, I would not been brought up in church, I'd not even I'd been in church the whole time, and if you know my testimony, the few times I did get to church, I got kicked out of the church Sunday school after the second week, I got kicked out of the church youth group after that was the second week as well, I got kicked out of the Cubs, I got kicked out of the Scouts, whatever had anything to do with God, I got kicked out of. So my upbringing wasn't real. Even as an infant school, I do remember praying to ask Jesus to come into my life and be my friend. But after that, I became probably one of the worst pupils in the school. So that kind of didn't really take hold in most days. That was just a little prayer. But in my mid-teens, I went to an ask group and I heard somebody present the gospel that Jesus loved me, that he died for me, he wiped away my sins, that he was buried and was resurrected. And do you know what my faith was? I agree. When he said, John Jesus, I went, yes. 
But we're in. For no angels really dancing on my doobie. For no lights. For no organ. Mm-hmm. Make it spooky. For nothing. Nothing at all. And I went, yes. And he said, right, as a Christian, this is what you've got to do. And I went, as a Christian, that's what I'm going to do. He said, read the Bible. Said, that's a good idea, I'll read the Bible. Now the good news there, at that point in my life, and this is probably why I'm a little bit different from most people, he told me to read the Bible. And I did. He did tell me to listen to every preacher on YouTube, because it didn't exist in those days. He didn't read, tell me to read books about the Bible. He just told me to read the Bible and find out who Jesus is. And I went, okay. So I did. And I read Romans, which was a fantastic book. Amongst others. But my faith was zero. This is what I'm getting to. My faith was zero. So God's biggest and greatest thing was to raise Jesus from the dead so I could be saved. And my faith was zero when I got saved. And the question is, has it grown since then? <coughs> has your faith grown since then? What's the biggest thing that we could ever do? Get saved. What do you need the most faith for in life? Technically, to get saved. So if I have zero virtual faith, and yet that's the most faith I'm going to ever have to need in my life, is to get saved. Now, admittedly, the written verse of the Bible says this, Well, God, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself, talk about faith. It is a gift from God, not by works, so no one can boast. So the faith that I had, as small as it was, was my faith, and God gave me the faith to believe him. So God gave me, and he gave you faith. We're still walking down this garden path towards this wall, so keep with me. Right? So God does the greatest thing he could ever do, raise Jesus from the dead, so that we could be saved. And as much as I cannot do anything except accept him, he gave me the faith to trust in him. Did... <laughs> What to put here? Did you have the same? So, did you have the same? Do you have the same faith today that you had then? Or should you have more? Yeah. Be very careful. I ask him to answer this question now, because you are going to walk you shut into a wall by your own words. So, if the faith that you had at the beginning should be greater than the faith you have now, and what you did at the beginning took more faith than you could do anything throughout your life. Because getting saved is the most important thing, is it not? Bruce already smiled, she knows it's a walk. <laughs> so what you did at the beginning with that minute baby type faith, I didn't even know the Bible. I didn't even know John 3.16. I've told you this before, I thought, Bridge Over Troubled Water by Simon and Garfunkel were a church song. Because I thought, Jesus is that Bridge Over Troubled Water. I just thought, because I didn't know. I was naive, I just read the Bible. The problem was I started going to church. The problem was I started getting other people's opinions on the Bible. I started listening to people that talked so of rubbish, really. Because they weren't talking the Bible, they were talking experience and not the Bible. When I heard the gospel, I just said, yes, I love it, that's it. Ding. I'm saved. You know, the greatest thing that God could ever do for me is save me. With that little faith, if you want to put it in that terms, we need to be careful of this. Do you know there's nowhere from Romans onwards in the Bible that talks about Christians having faith? Do you know that? Nothing. In fact, even in Acts, there's only one little reference to it, and it says that Paul saw that the man had faith to be healed. That's the only reference. Never about a Christian having more faith. There's no reference to a Christian having great faith. It's assumed that if you believe God, you have faith. Why? Because you've been given faith. Why well, need more faith? No, just use the faith you have to step out in things. So, Jesus, if Jesus can take my little bit of faith and your little bit of faith that we had when we first got saved, by now we should be water walking, mountain moving, powerhouses of God. And do you know what? That's exactly what you are. Yeah. But you've listened to so many people tell you you're not. The Bible says you are, and you go, yeah, but 
Yeah, but it says this in Romans 8, verse 11, and we'll get to this later, that if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through a spirit that dwells within you. So if you needed an ounce of faith at the beginning to get you saved, which is the biggest thing you'll ever do, and in which you need the most faith for, which because that's why God gives you it, anything else that happens thereafter is less faith. Print terms that most of you will understand. It's if you've got a thousand pounds in the bank and I say, take me for a coffee at Costa, and you've got a card and a thousand pounds in the bank, it's not going to break the bank to get me a coffee, which I don't drink anyway, so that's the point. Or chocolate, maybe. If it took faith to get saved, getting healed, getting delivered, getting set free, walking in faith, is n you don't need as much. Salvation faith, everything else is less. Because faith in salvation, or in Jesus, is the most important thing. You're looking at me really worried now. Because we've been listening to lies for so many years, we've messed it up. And if you don't believe we'll run through some of this stuff. Do you know that in Jesus' day, when Jesus was around, he was chosen, there's some interesting phrases in the Bible. But Pharisees used to get their knickers in a twist. Not that they wore them. But they used to get really uptight and angry and annoyed. Why? Because Jesus used to use words like this. Your sins are forgiven. See, to the Pharisees and Sadducees, somebody getting healed, they're like, yeah, I've got healed. It happened. It happened. The pool, the prophets, people got healed. They want a big deal. Somebody got healed, they're like, great, hey, okay, whatever. Somebody got forgiven. No. No way. But after centuries of the church, we switched that round. So in Jesus' time, getting healed was nothing. Getting forgiven was something that only God could do. Yes, Jesus was God, we know that. But only God could do that. And the church over the generation switched that round. So salvation and forgiveness is easy. Oh, yes, yeah, easy as that. Getting healed, oh no, 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 no. What's happened? We've been listening to all the lies. We've been listening to rubbish. Why? Because people have put themselves in a position, because of their experiences, they've limited God and then projected the limitations of God onto other people. Instead of going, hang on my experience is this, but the Bible says that. Which do I believe? My experience? Or that? Today people have turned things around to make things complicated. And Jesus preached, Jesus used to go, I think he did it deliber deliberately. What day is it? It's Saturday. Okay. Get to the synagogue and say to someone, your sins are forgiven. Just don't say everybody. To prove his sins are forgiven, Jesus would say, get up and rise. Take bed and go home. To prove they're forgiven, go and sin no more. <coughs> to prove, go in peace. Why? Because forgiveness of sins is the greatest. Everything else is minor from there. Yet we kind of come. <coughs> See, when Jesus talks about getting people saved, you know the word is sozo, which means to be made whole. Spirit, soul, and body. To be made whole. Everything. The problem is with that dictation to our ears for generations, and, and even you know, from people who care for us, and it's been some lies. You know, the devil lies to us. Our friends, our non-Christian friends lies to us. And do you know Christians, well-meaning Christians, unknowingly lie to us because of their experiences. So you need to believe the Bible or believe what everybody else says. See, I'm that sort of person, I read it and they go, and I read the Bible, and yet I'm not the greatest scholar. And people, I've noticed this, that if people don't like what it says, they unpack it into Greek and Hebrew and all these other stuff. And try and strip it down to something that it don't really mean. Where I go, you know what? Those people who wrote the Bible, take different translations, they're an expert in this, so they've got the general essence of the Bible. When it says, by his stripes you are healed, I don't think you can mess that one up. No, I just think it says that. Jesus walked on water, 
It wasn't ice, because it's in Israel, it's on a lake, so we kind of get the idea that he lived from the water. So they can't mess certain stuff up, but they do argue about different points. But the essence of the Bible is, we trust God because God's word is true. Why? Because God is true. Why? Because God spoke, and when God spoke, things happen. So do we believe the word of God, or do we believe what people say? And we've been lied to for so many years, and it's actually crept into our lives, so it brings doubt into us. Doubt is unbelief, really. We need to doubt our unbelief, but we don't. We doubt the word of God. If you go back to the beginning of the Bible, and you've got the situation in the Garden of Eden, uh, this is Genesis chapter 3, and it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animals that God, the Lord God had created, uh, made. He said to the woman, Did God really say? Question. That's the first one. Did God really say? If you can settle that question, when you read the Bible, did God really say? Whatever. I'm going to pick on healing because that's an obvious one. Did God really say by his straps heal? Yes. End of story. Nothing there. But Eve didn't have the Bible. She only had her husband. And like most women, they back up from that one. And we'll carry on sermon for that one out. Did God really say, you must not eat from the tree that's in the garden? Now get this, God gave so many trees, you can eat from anything. Eat it all. You can eat the gooseberries, that's over there. You can eat the apples, the pears, but I'm not so good with that. You could imagine whatever, you can eat from any tree, shrub, bush, whatever you want. They're all there, except this one. And she's like going, but why? Why can't I have that one? But you can have all this, but why? Why, 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 why? But then it says, did God really say it? Question it, brought doubt into her life. Brought a question mark. God's holding something back from you. No, he's not. He's given you everything except for that. We don't like that idea, but we live that way. You see, you can let somebody into your house, but there come a point at a certain time where you go, it's time to go unless you stop at night, but then might be a couple of nights, but it's still time to go, go, because there's limitations. So God put limits on mankind, and all he said is, you can eat from anything, you can have all this stuff. We don't know how big the garden was. It might have been the size of a little garden, I doubt it. It might have been huge. It could be massive. Who knows? But what we do know is there was a tree called the tree of life there, which they could eat from. I didn't bother her. You can have life or knowledge. Life or knowledge. Life in Jesus. Knowledge. Bible college. I'll have life in Jesus, please. <laughs> Sorry. That was me. Bible college. They told me not to come to Bible college because it'll kill you. But it actually did say that to me because it'll ruin you. Because you're not interested in writing an essay. You're only interested in doing the word of God. I said, excellent. That's what I want. That's what I'm good. But anyway. So... He wants to see it. He said, the serpent says, so the woman said to the son, we may eat of any tree in the garden, but God did say that we must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And then she added something else on, but you must not touch it either or you will die. Now Adam might have told it, because Adam knew his wife, you can't eat from it, or don't touch it either, because she was stroking it. Just don't go there. That's the license for preachers, sorry. You will certainly not die. So she, he brought doubt to her. Then he brought an absolute lie to her. And when he said, you will certainly not die. For God knows that when your eyes are open, when you eat, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God and know you good and evil. They were already like God. <clears throat> they were already like God. They weren't God, but they were like God. And he offered her something that would make her less than what she was. And she was deceived. Now, that's why in the New Testament we talk about her being <coughs> deceived, but Adam sinned. Because he knew better. And he chose for his wife. Which is actually a picture of Jesus. Who chose to be with his bride. And suffer with her. But didn't sin. When Adam chose to sin and suffer with his wife. Back to Abraham, so against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so he became a father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. He believed what had been said. This is when he got to get a Bible. 
and say, what does it say to you in the Bible? Hands at the back. But what does it say to you? What's been said to you in the Bible? And he believed what had been said to him. So we can believe what's been said to us. Once Abraham knew God, once Abraham got his son Isaac, all the other promises, it were like a given. If you read all the promises that were given to Abraham, he knew once I've got my son, all the rest will be straightforward. The son was the hard one. What's the hard one for us? Salvation. What's all the promises thereafter? Nothing compared to getting saved. They're just a natural progression of salvation. See, the devil wants to kill, steal and destroy. In other words, he wants to kill everything in your life. God just wants to give you life and life to the full, which comes from salvation. So everything thereafter should be a natural progression of your life producing good fruit in your life. Now, I don't mean you want persecution, you will have and you will have trouble, but Abraham knew that once he got his son, everything else would follow. Once we're in Christ, everything else follows. So how much faith did he need to get saved? How much did you have? Probably very little. So why do we ask for more faith to see God move now when he's done the greatest thing he could ever do for us when we didn't have that much faith? What was the difference? We just trusted. We're now, we're battling because we're allowing doubt and unbelief to creep in. But 2 Corinthians 1.20 says this, For all that for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ, not outside Christ, in Christ, and so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. So in Christ, all the promises stand. What's one of the promises? I've said I'm picking on healing, but there's so many more. But the promise of healing stands in Christ. Why? Because Christ is sick. There's no addiction in Christ. There's no, you know, suffering in Christ. And I'm not, I'm in broad because we do, we'll get into this in chapter 5, that we rejoice in our suffering. What I'm talking about suffering is the fact that we suffer for Jesus. Because he suffered for us. So we'll unpack that up. I think I'm saying we'll all live a perfect, brilliant life. But against all hope, Abraham in hope believed God and he became a father of many nations just as it had been said to him. What has been said to you? But when it gets to hope and stuff like that, you get to Hebrews 1, Hebrews 11 verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Complicated verse for me, is that? So I went to the New Living Translation and puts it a bit different. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for, and it is the evidence of the things we cannot see. So I slap a ring on Joe's finger of a hope of a marriage, an engagement ring it's called. That's a hope of something to come. But when we got married, I didn't take the ring off her, but I didn't hope we were going to get married, because we're already married. You don't hope for something you've already got, do you? If we've already got Christ, and with Jesus comes everything, it gets into an interesting set of words here. Set of principles coming out. So, in Romans 8, the word hope, by the way, there, um, now hope is a, a, a subs- faith is the substance of things hoped for, the word hope there, is to wait for salvation with joy and full confidence. The key word there is wait. That's not something we like. We'll get this into chapter 5 of Romans. <laughs> wait. Now in Romans 8, 28 it says this, for, for in this hope, the word hope there is, is the next one on the strong, strong numbers, and it means this, uh, a joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. So, in this hope, we, are, we were saved, but hope that has, has been seen is no hope at all, for who hopes what he already has? We have a hope of salvation in eternity, but we also have salvation now. Because we're already saved now, aren't we? So if you're already saved now, you don't have hope, your hope is in eternity, that we're going to spend forever with Jesus, but you're already experiencing eternity now. So who hopes for what he already has? You see, I don't, I don't hope I'm saved. I know I am. 
and nobody can take <coughs> away from me. How do you know? Do you know if you're saved? I am. Not I am the I am, but I am saved. Well, how do you know? I just know. Because many years ago, I decided yes to Jesus, and since then I've stood firm and went, yes. And even when the devil says to me, you're not saved, I go, yes, I am. It's like someone said, you know, you're not really called Johnny. If you want to know my real name, you should have been in my way, because I had to pronounce it. But when he says your name, you go, I'm fucking doubt there, aren't I? <laughs> What's his name? Is it John? Is it Jonathan? Is it Marmaduke? Who knows? Am I not going to tell you? But I stood there and I <laughs> proclaimed my name. But nobody can question my name because I know what it is. I just am. So when it comes to salvation, people say, John, how do you know he's saved? I am. Well, do you get a feeling? It's got nothing to do with feelings. Have you had a vision? No. I've just met Jesus. How have you met Jesus? In my heart and through the word of God. Have you seen the angel? No. Have you seen me? No. In fact, probably when it comes to that side of stuff, I've seen very little. I've seen God do mighty things through me to people, but in my own life, I've seen very little. So, when it comes down to it, we don't see much, but we have this up. So I'm not open, I'm saved, I know I am. I don't hope, but I'm blessed. Why? Because it's been said to me that I'm a blessing. So if I'm to be a blessing, I need to be blessed by God. So I don't hope I'm blessed, I am blessed. You see, I don't hope I'm healed. I am healed. The question, the problem though is, in that I've got to wait. Hope, waiting, is the evidence of things not seen. So the evidence of things not seen is a comfortable confidence of waiting. So when we got engaged, Joe and I, I had to wait. I had to wait. Now, I'll be honest, the, the wedding day we'll just get that event out of the way because we want a marriage. Why did we want a marriage? Because I wanted to spend the rest of my life with somebody. That was the last thing on my mind at that point. <laughs> Been there. But the truth was, we, <laughs> we used to talk about, you know, when we bought a house, to get a 25 year mortgage. 20, we've been married longer than that now. It comes, it goes. <laughs> you know what I mean? But the hope of the engagement ring were only part of it until we got married. You see, we're just going to wait. And I'm going to put lots of it around. Bless, 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 bless. Which is harder? Yeah, I think I've done that page as well, so we'll go there. Right? Mm. See, I don't, I don't hope I'm healed. I know that I'm healed. Why? Because it said in 1 Peter 2, verse 27, by he himself bore our sins and in our, his body on the cross, so that by, uh, we might be saved and live for righteousness by his wounds we are healed. It's interesting that sickness and sin um, and forgiveness are all tied together at the cross. Death is, you know, Sin leads to death, and sickness is only death in slow motion. That's all it is. Sickness is death in slow motion. So when Jesus died on the cross, he dealt with those two things and nailed them to the cross. Took our way, he, he gave us forgiveness, he gave us healing, it's all in Psalm 103, if you want to dig into that. So it's a power is in trusting in Jesus. Now if you turn to Acts 3, uh, 11 to 16, Peter and John just gone to the temple and healed this guy, I said this over the week, and he just said to him, what I, don't, what I have, I give to you, I don't have any cash, because you're a Pentecost still, um, and he just says, what I have, I give to you, in the name of Jesus, rise up, then he literally grabbed him and stood him up, never asked God, never prayed, never did a shabby do, and never wait for a vision or, or anything, just did it, so Peter's theology is kind of messed up, compared to the church today. No, the church's theology is completely messed up compared to the church in the Bible. But anyway, it says this, this is verse 11. It says, while the man who got healed was holding on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running um, to them in the place of Solomon, Solomon's colonnade. When Peter saw this, Peter always wanted to give a preaching in. Have you started reading the Bible and seeing the characters from Chosen now? When you're reading it, when Peter, so that's what you see, Peter's picture, that's an interesting one. When Peter saw this, uh, he said, fellow Israelites, why do you, why, why does this surprise you? Because somebody's been raised up. 
Oh, we're lords raised up when Jesus were around and he killed him. But now they're still surprised because people are still get mad. Why do you stare at us? Now this is the important thing. Why do you stare at us as if by our own power, whose power was he reaping? What are you using? God's power. The same power that raised, the same spirit that raised Christ from there is dwelling in you. And if you needed a little bit of faith to get saved and everything else is less than that, what's stopping you stepping out and everything else is in the spirit? So if it was by our own power or, there's a big or there, godliness. In other words, Peter's just announced that it's not his power, it's the Holy Spirit, and he's not good enough. He's not good enough to be used by God. And yet God's using him. So it's not by our own power or godliness that this man uh, has been made well. And then he goes on, the God of our Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus. You wanted him over to be killed and you disowned him uh, before Pilate is stirred up the Christ, going to have a fight through uh, though he decided to let him go, you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murder to be released to you. You killed the offer of life. Peter's going for it. And he's like, yeah, go for it. Um, but, but God raised him from the dead. Keep for it. God raised him from the dead. The most powerful thing God could do was raise him from the dead. And Peter's demonstrated the risen power of God by raising his man up, by, not by his own power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. And not because he's got good, but because he's trusted in God. And he continues. Uh, raising from the dead, and we are witnesses by faith in the name of Jesus. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know has, has been made strong. It is Jesus' name, not just saying Jesus, it's Jesus' name, and faith that comes through him that, this, that he has got complete healing that you can see. Amen. Get this. If the faith that you needed to trust in Jesus for your salvation was very little and it was a gift from God that got you saved in the first place, the salvation that you have today is the most important thing that could happen in your life and the greatest thing that God could ever do was raise Jesus from the dead. Marry those two together, you've made sozo, you're healed, you're saved, you're set free, you're made whole. Everything else is secondary to that, why are we not doing it? Because we've listened to lies and allowed doubt to go in. Romans 12 verse 3 says this, and I'm reading in the King James Version. It says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not, not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think. The problem is we're not thinking of ourselves highly, we're thinking of ourselves lowly and thinking we're no good. When Peter's already said, it's not because of our goodness that this man got healed, it's because of Jesus, so don't start putting yourself down or lifting yourself up, but think of yourself soberly as God has dealt each, of, each one of you a measure of faith. King James puts it this way, that God has dealt each of you the measure of faith. Amen. Do you know, none of you guys has more or less faith given by God than I have. So whatever I can do, you can do better. But I have no more or less faith than Smith Wigglesworth has. Or John Wesley has. Do you know you do not have more or less faith than Peter and John had at the Gate Beautiful? What's the difference? They just trusted. And they've not had generations of church life and YouTube clips telling us that you need to be perfect, you need to be awesome and amazing and have a CD and a good story and a good vision and a good face. You need to be having a perfect life and you need to be anointed with the anointment of anointing just to wet you down and do something good. You don't need to be anointed. You're already anointed from that point of the week. You're already anointed by God, filled with the Holy Spirit. And if the same Spirit that raised Christ then dwells in you, then he will, he will actually look after your mortal body, the outside, and God will, will sort out the inside 
that the measure or a measure or the measure or a measure of faith has been given to you. So, backtrack a little bit. How much faith did you need to get saved? A measure. A tiny measure. A little bit, because you didn't know anything. Well, faith comes by in a million, that's how to eat bad, yeah. But you didn't know anything. But you trusted, didn't you? And if you trusted them and God gave you faith to trust him more, for it's not by, it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and this isn't, this isn't of yourself, it's a gift from God. So you've been given faith to get saved, how much more will be given the measure of faith so you can outwalk the life in faith? See, it's not complicated. Do you know what faith is? I'll nail it down to one thing. Yes. Do you believe? Yes. What do you think? Yes. What are you going to do? Trust. Yes. That's faith. And then, doing something about it. Not wavering. Not going to the left or right. You see, when I said yes to Jesus, I meant yes to Jesus. In second place to that, when I said yes to Joe, it meant no to the other three and a half billion women in this planet. That's a choice. And faith is a choice. Yes. And now I'll wait. Yes. And now I'll wait. That's faith. That's so simple. That's kind of too simple. I don't think I'll write any selling books on that one, will I? Kind of CD series on that, can you? Yes. I believe. Yes. I trust. Yes, it says this, and yes, I believe it. And it's by the name of Jesus. It's the name of Jesus and faith that comes through him. Faith that comes through who? Through Jesus. And this is what it boils down to. If the greatest thing God could ever do is make a way for you to come to him, will he not give us everything that we need for life and godliness? 1 Peter, sorry, 2 Peter 1. Will he not make every way clear for us? Will he not give us everything, do everything? Are we not, as Christ is now, we are like him now? He's given the angels to defend us, the Holy Spirit to empower us, he's given his word on our mouth, he's given us a, a fire in our bellies, he's set us a blaze to go out for him, and he says, just go, trust me. But I don't feel called. We'll cover that later on, because that's another lie from the devil. Because the first thing you should do, we should be prayers, we should be worshippers, we should be witnesses. And after that, find a calling and do whatever it is. But we'll ever be praying, witnessing and worshipping. Don't worry about everything else. Do those and see what happens. That's it. Decide. Yeah. See, when you go through to the back today, the big decision is tea or coffee. Now that's not a decision for me. It's tea. Because I don't drink coffee. At least this week. I don't do it. So, you're just trying to think what my name is, aren't you? <laughs> but I'm going to say, tea please. That's the biggest choice I've got. When it comes to Jesus, it's Jesus. It's not Jesus plus. It's not this, then Jesus. It's Jesus. That's it. Simple, but hard, because it's a waiting bit, a waiting. And do you know what, we've been told so many lies for so many years, that we accept anything, walk with everything that's not of God, and have it for our salvation, when it's got so much more for us. Now I know you already know this, but I'm telling it for people watching online. So be blessed, be encouraged, be awesome, be who you're supposed to be. The army of God, be a child of God, a king, a priest of Jesus. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are doing amazing things. And I pray right now that you will just steady our hearts. Lord, that you will allow us to see what you're saying and not what I'm saying and not what anybody else has said. Let your Bible stand firm, Lord, in our hearts, beyond anything any man might say. And help us to trust in you through your word at every point. 
asking for advice sometimes, but trusting you at all times. In the name of Jesus. Amen.